thank you, Richard, and thank you all for coming. It is a privilege and an honor to stand up here with so many people who have spent so much time over so many years attempting to bring rational health care reform to the United States and standing in opposition to bills such as the Obamacare bill. But we need a few moments, I think, of critical self-reflection over how some of the arguments against this bill played out on a political level. And I want to focus on one of them. Because certainly, the last year does not count as successful for those who are upholding freedom in medicine. The Democrats have now pushed the health care issue into the background replacing it with other issues of financial and foreign policy concern, doing that so that they can busily set out to write the 20 to 30,000 pages of regulations that will be necessary to implement this bill. You just look at the Obamacare bill and find how many times in here it says, the secretary shall determine, blah, blah, blah. All of that requires. And the, the, average, uh, and the average regulations to such a bill is about 10 to 1. So it gets set for something around 27,000 pages of regulations to enforce this. Now, the government, Congress passed this bill despite energetic and even heroic attempts by many organized groups to stop it, and despite millions of private citizens gathering spontaneously in tea parties. President Obama himself flew over a tea party in Washington, D.C. in a helicopter. I was there and saw him saw hundreds of thousands of Americans gathered in opposition to his policies and looked the other way and acted the other way. Now, one theme to the opposition, I think, to Obamacare rose constantly in the national press. As we see here, of course, it is not true that the opponents of government medicine are simply naysayers with no answers of their own. As you are hearing here, people have well worked out, developed positions, and viable, comprehensive alternatives to Obamacare. But there was one theme I saw in the press that kept appearing in opposition to the bill, and that was its cost. The bill is bad because it will cost thousands of billions of dollars. The bill is bad because of the astronomical costs of insuring tens of millions of Americans. You know, and the pattern would be that a Republican opponent would stand up and say, my calculations show that the bill will cost $1.3 trillion over 10 years. By the way, I do not like the word trillion. It trivializes, trivializes literally, the uh, enormous sums involved, say $1,300 billion or $1.3 million, million dollars, if you'd like, to really concretize this. And so, in response, the Democrats would come back and say, no, it's not going to cost that much. President Obama came back at one point and said he was going to be firm. He would not sign a bill if it cost more than $900 billion over the next 10 years. So the Democrats went back, changed all the figures, resubmitted them to the Congressional Budget Office in order to show that it would only cost $900 billion. We all know that the final cost will be somewhere on the order of four to five times that. But that did not deter them. The supporters of government medicine simply rewrote the figures, ignored the economic destruction, and passed it anyway. They ignored the considered and expert testimony of Mr. David Walker, a name that every American should know. He is the former Comptroller General of the United States who has shown that the structural deficits in our entitlement programs will lead inevitably to national bankruptcy by the 2030s at the latest. He is showing that by the 2030s, Medicare and Social Security alone will be running annual deficits of some $900 billion. That's annually. That's annually. This was all ignored. Why was this ignored? And the answer at root is because the Democrats have never looked at this as an economic issue. And I should say, instead of the Democrats, I should say the proponents of government medicine have never looked at this as an economic issue. Economics is entirely secondary to them. They promoted this bill and promoted government medicine repeatedly despite its failure every place it's been tried because they see it as a moral issue. And we have to ask ourselves, do we see with the same conviction that they do, that they are morally wrong. 
They see this, they, they ignored, rewrote, fudged, and I'm even going to say lied about the economics because to them, the core issue is not economic, I repeat, it is moral. They see healthcare as a moral right. And because it is a moral right, it is worth any cost, even national bankruptcy. And so the question is, you know, where does it stand to answer such a charge on, in terms of economics? What does it do to stand there and argue about the cost? Well, consider if you went to a car dealer and you were negotiating over a car, and he said, you can have the car for your trade-in plus $10,000, and you said, I'll give you the trade-in plus $8,000. What have you admitted? You both admitted that the car is very valuable and it belongs, you should have it. It's a valuable car, it's a good car, it's a good product. You're just arguing over $8,000 versus $10,000, right? So by arguing about the cost of the bill, the implicit argument that's brought into the, that's been bring, that's being brought forward is that the bill is morally proper. So if we could just get the cost down, it would be okay. Whereas I would maintain that the Obamacare bill is viciously immoral because if it's an attack on individual rights, an attack on the moral nature of man, an attack on each person's right to live his own life, exercise his own liberty, and pursue his own happiness, and I wouldn't care if it costs zero, it is still viciously immoral. Do we really understand that all government control of medicine is deeply immoral? That it enslaves doctors to bureaucratic rules? That it will enslave patients to certain standards of insurance and care and in their choices? That it will enslave insurance companies and institutions, valuable moral institutions who provide the financial strength necessary for the care uh, needed by those with serious diseases. To reform medicine in this country, meaning to reform the financial basis of medical care, remember that's what we're talking about, to reform the financial basis of medical care, we must start from a moral conviction. Each man's life belongs to him. It is his own life. And that applies to my doctor, it applies to me, and it applies to the insurance company and all of their employees and stockholders and owners. Each man's right to his own life, his liberty, and to pursue his own happiness is supposed to be guaranteed in the founding documents of this nation. It is not true, as Nancy Pelosi said in her remarks before the bill was taken on Obamacare, that she is on the side of the right to life, because obviously if you need something to stay alive, it should be given to you. Such a, such a claim involves a vicious contradiction. The contradiction is that because I need something, even if I need it desperately, therefore I have the right to destroy the, the right and the liberty, to destroy the rights and liberty of someone else. And who is it that I have the right to destroy? He who can save my life. That is a vicious, immoral contradiction. The claim to a right to a health care, um, therefore, involves this vicious contradiction, elevates need over the rights of those who provide the satisfaction of the need and indeed says, because I'm dying, therefore those who can save me become my slaves. And that is immoral. We need to approach this issue from the starting point by claiming, indeed demanding, the moral high road. We are in favor of life, each person's right to live his own life as he wishes. We are in favor of liberty. We're in favor of the pursuit of happiness and we are consequently then in favor of prosperity and innovation and all of the consequences that flow from this. We must not let arguments about such, such uh, proposals collapse into arguments about cost. Of course Obamacare is a fiscal train wreck. This is a result of its immorality. So I stand and I ask you to stand too for private medicine, private financing of medical care, and private decisions about such care. This is the moral position. This is the position that upholds each man's right to his own life. Thank you very much. Thank you, John.